seems like every time that we pop back on the air here on 104.5 The Team, there is something new, something interesting that's happening in the college football world. And to help us make sense of everything in the college football realm, we welcome on the college football analyst from Pro Football Focus, as well as the host of the preferred walk-on show and a good friend of the drive. He is Max Chadwick. Mr. Chadwick, good afternoon, sir. How are you? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, the the pleasure is all ours. Thanks for for joining us today. There is a a ton that's going on, seemingly both uh, both on the field and off right now in college football. I have to ask you first about something that you had just posted on your on your Twitter account uh, a few minutes before we we started chatting. Uh, the the news out of Texas, Quinn Ewers returning. We've all kind of been waiting for the the next Manning to make his debut and kind of grab hold of the college football world. What do you think happens next for him after this news? Yeah, I want to make it clear that it was just a report that came out about Quinn Ewers. And the sure. report said, you know, there's a 90% chance he goes back. And listen, he doesn't have to make any decision until January. So who knows? I mean, he can go on an absolute tear. He could make the college football playoff, go on a tear there, maybe even win the national championship. And then, you know, after that, it'd be pretty hard for him to uh, to pass up the NFL draft at that point. So, right. Uh, it's still very much up in the air whether or not Ewers is coming back. But that report did say that it's more likely than not that he will be returning for another year at Texas. So then all of a sudden, like you said, I mean, you look at the quarterback room they have there, not only Arch Manning, but Malik Murphy as well. Uh, There are probably a lot of schools that would be interested in Malik Murphy's services as well. So uh, I don't know what uh, would happen there. I don't know if Arch Manning would be willing to sit for another year. I don't know if Malik Murphy would be willing to sit for another year. Um, So then you might have both those guys enter the transfer portal. And then, I mean, if Arch Manning enters the transfer portal, that will be the biggest transfer ever. I I made the joke that, you know, ESPN should bring back the decision, like what they did for LeBron James when we went to the Miami Heat. Uh, I I think that it will be that big. You know, that might be the biggest transfer ever in terms of how hyped uh, wherever he goes is. So very interesting situation right now. If if Ewers goes back, I'm very curious to see – if Arch Manning is willing to sit for another year instead of uh, trying to get his uh, become a starter in his sophomore season. Yeah, I, I'd be really very curious as well, and it seems like an apt time to remind everybody to follow you on Twitter as well at Max Chadwick CFB, where you can see great content like that uh, coming every single day during football season and beyond. Uh, to remain in Texas with one of the other biggest storylines uh, coming out of Texas A&M, parting ways with Jimbo Fisher. The buyout, $76 million, which blows everybody's mind just to begin with, but I, I, I'm from everything that from a lot of what I've seen, this isn't a huge shock in terms of this move being made, but what did you make of the move itself? Where do you see this program going after this move? Yeah, honestly, I, I'm not shocked by this at all. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, $76 million. I mean, that You look back at the biggest buyouts in uh, college football history, uh, this is obviously number one at $76 million. Number two was Gus Malzahn at Auburn at $21.5 million. So we're talking about three times what Texas A&M is paying uh, for that. That just shows, and that, so that brings me to my next point. This is a really good job. This is a really, really good job. This, this shows you know, th- their willingness to pay $76 million to a good, not great coach to not be there anymore just shows that how willing they are to spend whatever is necessary in order to get a national championship contender. So I think this is a top 10 to 15 job in college football. You can probably count on two hands the amount of coaches that will probably be saying, you know, I'm kind of comfortable where I am right now. Otherwise, everyone else is going to be looking at that with, uh, you know, and drooling a little bit, honestly. So uh, I I think it's a really good job. I think, listen, you you see how much money they have in in terms of how much they paid Jimbo and then how much they're paying Jimbo to not be there anymore. (laughs) Also, in 2022, they had the greatest recruiting class ever. They had eight of the top 25 players in the country go there uh, in 2022, and that whole started the Nick Saban, Jimbo Fisher beef where Nick Saban accused Texas A&M of buying their players. And it's like, yeah, sure, they might have done that, but it just shows how much money they have to even do that in the first place. So, right. Uh, it's a really good job. I think I think this is a sleeping giant right now. Uh, I think if they, they just need to nail their coach, man. They really need to nail this hire because if they do, I think this is a, a program that has the resources – has the facilities, has the money to to compete for national championships with the likes of Georgia 
and Alabama. So I, I think this is a huge, huge opening uh, that just happened in college football. Wow. Okay. Those are. I mean, those are a lot of reasons, uh, of course, for that job to be desirable. Do you have a a dream candidate in mind that you think might fit the criteria of of really nailing a hire like this? Yeah, so I think there's a few names to keep in mind. So a couple of them that I've heard thrown out there a lot, I, I just don't think they would leave. Uh, Dan Lanning, who came out yesterday, the Oregon coach, and said, I'm not leaving. Sure. Says, I'm very happy where I am right now. He's like, I'm not. I, I think that's a comparable enough job that he wouldn't leave. Uh, Mike Norvell from Florida State, I doubt he leaves either, and I doubt even Texas A&M fans would be open to getting another Florida State coach <laughs> to the program. Sure. Uh, but he would be a fantastic hire. I, I don't think either of them would be interested in this job. So then I think you look at a guy like Mike Elko, the uh, the Duke head coach, who has done a fantastic job at Duke. And right before he was, he was hired at Duke, uh, he was Texas A&M's defensive coordinator for a few seasons. So he's got ties to the program as well. Uh, Duke went 9-4 and four in his first season there. In the two seasons before, they were 5-18. and 18. So he's been a fantastic coach for Duke. He, he's turned a, a basketball school into a, a really good football program as well. So he's a guy that I, I'm looking at. Lane Kiffin, I think, would be very interested in this job as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was interested in the Auburn job last year. I think this is a way better job than Auburn. Uh, so I, I think Texas A&M should really look at him. Uh, Kalen DeBoer is another guy I would love to see at Texas A&M, the Washington head coach. I think this. Is, I think the Washington job again. He might be comfortable where he is with you know them competing for playoffs. Sure. But at the same time, I don't. I don't think it's as good of a job as Oregon or Florida State. He might be willing to to make the move to Texas A&M. And I think they should really look at him. Uh, another a couple another couple names. Lance Leifold from Kansas. I think would be a really good hire as well. He's he's an amazing. He's a miracle worker. Honestly, in Kansas <laughs> for making that program where it is right now. Yeah. Um, and then I've heard Jeff Trailer a lot too, the UTSA coach. Hmm. I wouldn't love that that much. I think they can make a much splashier hire, but he's made, he's done a really good job at uh, at UTSA as well. The voice you're hearing is that of Max Chadwick. Again, he is the college football analyst with Pro Football Focus and the host of the Preferred Walk-On Show. You have to make sure you download that show, and you have to follow him on Twitter as well. That is at Max Chadwick, CFB for great information like we're hearing uh, right here. Now, y- you mentioned a team like Washington. They're they're kind of in that group at the top as we, we look at the rankings coming out of week number 12. Georgia, no surprise, still in that number one spot, but what do you make of the, the current landscape of of the cream of the crop, the top of the top in college football, and uh, and the teams that you believe as we move closer and closer to the playoffs will will really remain in that contention. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a nightmare scenario that that could happen, and it's very possible of happening of you know having a, a one loss Alabama beat Georgia, having a one loss Texas win the Big Twelve championship, um, and having Oregon beat Washington and being a one loss like that could really happen. And all of a sudden, you're looking at uh, probably an undefeated Michigan or Ohio State that I, they obviously would get in. Yep. Um, and then you have probably an undefeated Florida State would get in as well if they if they went out, obviously. But then after that, it's like, okay, what do you do after that? And then I think I think they probably put in Oregon and they probably put in Alabama. And it sounds weird because Texas beat Alabama in Tuscaloosa, so that creates all sorts of headaches for the College Football Playoff Committee. And I do not <laughs> envy their position if that happens because yeah. that's an impossible impossible decision to make because Alabama. I think their resume is is way be, would be way better than Texas, especially if they beat Georgia. Mm-hmm. But then Texas beat Alabama, so it's like, okay, what are you going to take? The team that has a bit better resume overall, or the team that won head to head? So I think that's a impossible decision to make for the playoff committee. So it's going to be very interesting. There's still nine teams, I would say, that are still technically alive mm-hmm. in the college football playoff race, and. Uh, obviously a lot's going to change over the next three weeks, so it's going to be very exciting to see who actually are the Final Four at the end of the day. Okay, so you bring up the the nightmare scenario there, and it it is amazing how many moving parts would come into play in that one, but do you have have an other end, a dream scenario of a college football playoff with those nine teams that are still in contention that you think would bring the, the best competition, the best tournament for us? Oh, good question. I so actually, what I think my dream playoff would be is actually what I think the actual college football playoff would be. Oh, okay. Um, so I think it works out perfectly. Hopefully, it does happen. But <laughs> I think Georgia. I think Georgia is going to beat Alabama. I think they're going to uh, win the SEC, finish undefeated. They're going to be your number one team. I think Michigan's going to beat Ohio State. They're going to win the Big Ten championship. They're going to be your number two team. I think Florida State's going to win out and they're going to win the ACC title. They're going to be your number three. And then I think Oregon beats Washington in a rematch. And I think they get in over Texas. 
who I think will also win out as well. I think Oregon will beat Washington, get revenge on them, and get in as number four. So you'll have Georgia against Oregon in the Sugar Bowl probably, and then you'll have Michigan against Florida State in the Rose Bowl. And I, I mean, I would be oh. over the moon with that playoff because those are four teams that are really good offensively and defensively. I mean, you got four complete teams. Uh, that'll be an unbelievable playoff that I, I personally would not uh, be very excited to see. Oh my God! Yeah, I would. Uh, that's that's plan canceling kind of football right there. That's yeah. you're, you're completely ch- and just coming from a fan perspective. Yeah, do not bother me. I'm watching every single moment of that. I, I I really do hope that that does become the case. Now I have to ask you, coming from from my position. I'm a Giants fan, so uh, I'm 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 sure you've seen all of the the chaos going at the quarterback position in New York. There are teams that are in need uh, of quarterbacks when uh, this college football season uh, ends up ending and we get to the 2024 draft. So, from what you've seen in college football this year, there are a couple of major names that are going to be at the top of everybody's draft board. But are there guys in the draft class of 2024 that you see transferring into the NFL and possibly? having the the skill set to be good professional quarterbacks that could fit teams like the Giants. Yeah, well, listen, uh, uh, you know, I'm joking around here, but I actually it was uh, I went to Syracuse University, and my classmate and a bunch, bunch of my classes was actually Tommy DeVito. Oh, so really? It's, it's been it's been pretty <laughs> I, it's been pretty funny seeing all the all the stuff about him, and yeah. I'm so mad with him, and uh, it's, it's honestly hilarious that he's honestly starting NFL games right now. I think, yep. I think that's so cool. Yep. But yeah. uh, otherwise, you know, if they're not going to stick with Tommy DeVito, which they probably aren't, uh, <laughs> I would probably say. That uh, the two at the top, and right now the Giants have the second overall pick in the draft. Right, right now. So right. I mean, they're, we're we're in Caleb Williams, Drake May territory for yeah. right now, and especially with Daniel Jones out for the season, uh, this is going to be a nightmare second half of the year for the Giants. So I think there's a real, real chance that they get the number one overall pick. Honestly, so yeah, uh, I think Caleb Williams is still the the clear top guy. I would love to see that uh, in uh, New York, obviously. So. Um, you know, I, I think he would with Josh Day, with Brian Dable, excuse me, and I, I think he would be really good there. And I think he's still the number one guy. He, he's a guy that you know has to rein it in a little bit. He's not a very guy that likes to play in structure a lot. He kind of reminds me a lot of Kyler Murray in that aspect. Mm-hmm. But man, the, the talent that he has is ridiculous, and I think he deserves still to be the number one pick. And then at number two, I would probably say is Drake May. So if the Giants don't get him at number one, they could also just go Drake May as a, as a really nice consolation prize at number two and Drake may, I mean, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of Justin Herbert comps for him. Wow. Um, he's a guy that loves to play within the pocket. He's a guy that, you know, you, you could trust more to, to play within the system more than Caleb Williams is kind of going to, you know, try to be a hero on maybe too many plays, but he has the talent to do it at the same time. So, you know, Drake may at the same time, really talented kid. Um, I would not personally take him number one, but in any other year, I mean, he would be the clear-cut number one pick, probably. So, wow. uh, he he's a guy that I, I'm really high on as well, and I think you know the Giants would be really happy with uh, either of them as their next franchise quarterback. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, though, after after hearing your perspective on this, I feel like I'm kind of rooting for Tommy DeVito even more now. I was rooting for him <laughs> before, but now, I mean, now now knowing the connection there, I it, it is kind of remarkable. I, I've I've loved to see the uh, the how much that he's kind of been embraced by the team and stuff like that. And he still lives at home, so what a stud! But uh, right. it, it, we'll 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 see what he's capable of down the stretch. But yeah, it does seem like a top pick uh, is coming for it, that group. It's weird that you know everyone's praising Tommy DeVito, saying how awesome it is when he lives at home. But when I did it for two years after college, right. everyone was, you know, called me a loser and everything. So right. It's, it's weird how the shoe falls in the other foot. Yeah, exactly. The double standard is ridiculous. But <laughs> yeah, re- re- regardless of that, uh, Max, always a pleasure to catch up with you here on the drive. He is Max Chadwick from Pro Football Focus, college football analyst and host of the Preferred Walk On Show. Follow him on Twitter at Max Chadwick CFB. Max, thank you so much for your time. As always, uh, enjoy the the rest of the regular season in college football. And the some of the tournaments and uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you ahead of the college football playoff. Sounds great. Thanks so much, guys.